is a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, and we thank him for all his service. Thank you. Chamber today, Ukrainian Canadians, Ukrainian Canadian world veterans from the Second World War who fought. Peter, speaker has uh, acknowledged his mistake uh, and has apologized, uh, but this is something that is deeply embarrassing to the Parliament of Canada and by extension to all Canadians. Uh, I think particularly of Jewish MPs and all members of the Jewish community across the country who are uh, celebrating Yom, or commemorating Yom Kippur today. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Bandera Lobby blog. I am your host, Moss Robison, and this week I'm thrilled to be joined by another son of Detroit, Dr. John Paul Himka, a leading historian of Ukraine and author of numerous books, the most recent being Ukrainian Nationalists and the Holocaust, Oun and Upa's Participation in the Destruction of Ukrainian Jewry, 1941 to 1944, which was published in 2021. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Himka. I say thank you for joining us today because people may not realize this, but you and I actually share the same handler in Moscow, who, uh, in fun fact, is the producer of this show and is a little camera shy, but listening in to make sure that we say all the right things. What? On a serious note, um, as you know, uh, Yaroslav Hunka, a 98-year-old veteran of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division, recently received a standing ovation in Canadian Parliament. Ukrainian-Canadian world veteran from the Second World War who fought the Ukrainian independence against the Russians. Well, anyways, I invited you onto the Bandera Lobby show before this all happened um, to debunk some powerful myths about the OUN and UPA, uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and their armed forces, the Ukrainian insurgent army. But I thought we would start here. Um, what's your reaction? What's been your reaction to hearing all this about this? Um, have you been getting a lot of calls from journalists um any thoughts and comments you'd like to share for us and also maybe sorry too many questions but um if you let me ask a naive question i'm sure many people are wondering is how could something like this happen today okay i've been getting a lot of calls and uh requests um some of which i've accepted and some of which i've turned down uh, I've turned down, for instance, a right-wing talk show that wanted me to talk about this because they want to stick it to the Liberal Party here in Canada. So I don't, I don't like the instrumentalization of my work. So I wouldn't do that. But I, I spoke to a Globe and Mail reporter just, just before we started uh, our conversation. And it struck me that she didn't know much history. And then in the Globe and Mail today, I, I read this article by Marcia Lederman, opinion piece that was very, very ignorant in many ways. So I think a part of the problem is there's just a general ignorance of Ukrainian history, even though like people like me who are Ukrainian historians have been working to try to get people to, to learn things. Um, so yeah, it's been a bit of hullabaloo. I think it will blow over. And I think we, we, we get in this position because there really hasn't been an examination of, uh, of the various Ukrainian factions during World War II and the, um, composition of the overseas Ukrainian diaspora that came after World War II, where, uh, you know, certain myths uh, were propagated, some things were kept silent. Uh, and in, in that situation, 
uh, a person like Yaroslav Unko or, 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 or relatives or friends could say, well, this man fought the, fought the Russians back in the 1940s during World War II, and he's a Ukrainian hero. Mind you, I don't think that everybody who's in the SS, you know, off an SS division, Galician, probably the vast majority of them didn't have anything they personally did as uh, atrocities. Um, but so that, you know, the fact that a person was a member of that division isn't, isn't so, so terrible. Everybody went through the war in, uh, of that age. But to be honored as a Ukrainian hero, because he fought the Russians during World War II, kind of strikes me that that is so ignorant that we were actually, you know, we were allies with the uh, Soviets um, during World War II because we needed them to uh, help beat the Germans. And uh, when you fought against the Germans, you were not fighting for democracy and, uh, and things like that. Now, I understand why uh, the Galicians would want to join an anti-Soviet army. But uh, nonetheless, I, I, uh, I, I think you have to take into mind a larger historical situation. Which is, if you're, you know, there was this, uh, um, there was a famous debate in Germany called the Historiker Streit, the uh, the debate among the historians, or the conflict among the historians, which Habermas eventually settled, and it started with a with a with a German historian arguing that once the Soviets crossed into East Prussia, the uh, forces which were fighting the Soviets were defending their homeland. And uh, therefore, uh, there should be no opprobrium for what they did. And uh, Habermas pointed out that that's not true, that you know, you, you, when you're holding back the army that is going to be liberating concentration camps and, and so forth, that you really have to uh, uh, look at it in that larger perspective. And I, I think that perspective has to be borne in mind as well. That larger perspective of the Soviets were our allies against Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. He's also declared a Canadian hero too. It seemed like it was a, everyone stood to applaud him yeah. who was there. And um, it seemed, you know, when I think a lot of people who see this in online are saying, well, okay, he fought against the Russians for Ukrainian, fought against the Russians in World War II. So that must mean he's fighting with the Germans, obviously. And, but for the people who are applauding, they don't, I think the ironic thing is they don't realize he's a veteran of the Galicia division. They think he's like an UPA veteran, if anything, you know. They too fought against the Soviets. But, uh, I mean, UPA is much more criminal organization than the uh, SS Galicia. I mean, really, by comparison, uh, by comparison, SS Galicia is, is relatively guiltless, particularly in regard to the Holocaust, while, uh, while UPA is... Uh, is uh, guilty uh, in the Holocaust and in ethnic cleansing and many other uh, crimes during the war. A Galician has a smaller record. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I mean is that I think there were there have been people who said, oh, you know, I didn't realize I was applauding a Galician division veteran. I thought I was applauding uh, like a Ukrainian partisan who fought the communists, you know, during and after World War II, which to me, I assume that means upa um and so it's i think to most people they think it's worse that it's a waffen ss veteran but there's been a lot of can, can, let me interrupt here boss there's yes. been a lot of confusion on that issue and here's the source let me let me go back a little bit in the in the history at uh, one point in particularly the 1980s uh the soviets discovered uh that the West was really sensitive on the Holocaust question. You know, there had been uh, move in the uh, in seventies, uh, early seventies. There was the um, oh that famous TV serial on the Holocaust, uh, called the Holocaust, actually. Yeah. <laughs>
Not much today, sir. The villages have been cleaned out. Sergeant, are those civilians? Who are they, folks? Ukrainian, sir. They like to watch. And, uh, and, you know, there was growing interest in this, and it became kind of a cornerstone of the moral obligations in the West, you know, never again. And uh, in order to tar the overseas diaspora, they began um, uh, a campaign to find war criminals in Canada. I have the I had the luck that I actually had uh, materials that the Soviets sent to the Ukrainian Canadian communist Petro Kravchuk. So I know what they were looking for. And all they sent to him was nothing about Oun, nothing about UPA, only about Waffen SS Galizien. And the reason for that, Moss, is that the Soviets could never comprehend the Holocaust. There had been no Holocaust studies allowed in the Soviet Union. There had been almost no discourse allowed around the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. People had their individual memories, but there was no processing of what happened. And so the Soviets, for them, Oonupa were bad. Yes, they were bad. But Bafan SS Galician fought against them, betrayed the motherland, swore an oath to Hitler. And for them, that was the great crime. And so they started, they started a campaign against SS Galician in the 80s. The whole Deschain Commission was about Waffen SS Division Galician, uh, missing the real Holocaust perpetrators, the, you know, because Waffen SS Galician had very little to do with the Holocaust by comparison to how many other people had so much to do with the Holocaust. And then the friends of Saul, of the, of the, um, the friends of the, the Wiesenthal Center, uh, I have to say, I don't think they're very scholarly. Uh, and they focused on the division. And then in Britain, they began to focus on the division and say they ran death camps and things like that. And uh, so this, Focus on the uh, Waffen SS Division Galician, I think, really um, confused people who wanted to understand the Holocaust in Ukraine. Because uh, Waffen SS, I, I wrote a whole book about Ukrainian nationalists and the Holocaust. And really, there was no room in it for Waffen SS because they were not big perpetrators like the organization of Ukrainian nationalists or the Ukrainian insurgent army. So uh, I, th I think that, that uh, this, uh, the Soviets couldn't understand the Holocaust. And so they, but they could understand treason. And that's why they've singled them out. Not that the Waffen SS, you know, I mean, I can tell you about the problems with the Waffen SS, you know, what, you know, what they did and what the problems were, but, um, you know, I, I, I do I do feel that it's re rather misled people and this concentration on those people. And, and in the meantime, Canadian government, American government have been supporting our own fronts for years in large amounts of money. So you'd say that those uh, efforts by the Soviets backfired? Well, I don't know if they... Yeah, they backfired for sure, because what they, it's... It's like arresting the wrong guy, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a, in a, in a crime novel, uh, because the Soviets were the angriest at the, at the, at the, at the Lapin SS. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like they put out things about, um, uh, particularly in English, they like to, you know, do things about war crimes in, in Ukraine. And, uh, but normally they would concentrate on the Galician and they would concentrate on the police, ignoring you know, and I think are the major perpetrators of the Ukrainian organizations. Was that true for um, was it Michael Hanushiak, who wrote Lest We Forget? I think that was earlier in the 70s. Um, oh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was one of the earliest ones. And uh, he did have some stuff on Oun, yes. Hmm. But mainly, uh, but, but again, concentration was tended to be elsewhere.
but would you say maybe that also backfired because i mean i know that's where isn't that where um Yaroslav Stetsko, this autobiography that he writes for the Germans, saying that he supports the methods for yes, he, German they quoted Jews. it. They didn't say where it was. You know, they didn't cite the archives because they're, of course, highly secret Soviet uh, uh, archives. And um, uh, yeah, so it backfired in the sense that once they did it in one of their KGB pamphlets, which is what lest we forget really was. It wasn't written by Michael Hanusak at all. He just lent his name to it. It was written by, by KGB operatives. Um, once they put it first in this libelous book, everybody who looked at it, like when I first saw that, when I first read Lest We Forget, I, it didn't sound true to me. It didn't sound true to me until Marko Tsarinek and um, Karl Berkhoff went into the archives, found the original autobiography, and did an analysis in Harvard Ukrainian studies. And when I looked at that, and then subsequently you know, in my book on, uh, on Ukrainian nationalists and Holocaust, I, I, I think I pound a nail into the coffin of uh, those who deny that this was an authentic uh, piece of writing by, uh, by Yaroslav Stetsko. Hmm. And that, lest we forget, that also came out around the time of when Holocaust, the NBC, I think it was, Absolutely. aired. Yeah. And that was what they were trying to get on. Mm -hmm. It does seem like, I mean, I'm not, I'm far from an expert on this stuff, but it seems like all these, I mean, starting with, and I'm sure maybe before then, but at least starting with the assassination of Bandera, it's like all these major things done to combat the nationalists by the Soviets ends up backfiring. I mean, instead of, you know, Bandera, letting uh, Bandera, who's drifting into irrelevance, irrelevance, it seems, you know, turn him into the biggest martyr of, you know, the Cold War um, for Ukrainians, nationalists. Um, and, uh, and maybe a more recent example is... Uh, it seems like this is drilled into people that it's all Russian propaganda. And um, Justin Trudeau addressing this recent scandal with the um, Boffin SS veteran said, you know, it's extremely upsetting and deeply, deeply embarrassing. But then he immediately pivots to say, it's going to be really important that all of us push back against Russian propaganda, Russian disinformation and continue our steadfast and unequivocal support for Ukraine. I mean, even given this history, there's no, I don't, you know, Russian propaganda didn't trick the House of Commons into inviting him and recognizing him and getting everyone to stand and applaud. Um, but it's like, it's, uh, the priority seems is just winning this information war. Um, and, uh, and yet from this perspective, it's like Canada really shot itself and Ukraine in the foot by doing this um and uh and so i think it's a little curious you know of course apologies have been made to the jewish community um which jewish groups have loudly denounced this and um happens right on the eve of yom kippur but there was no apology to the ukrainian community um and meanwhile but you know it's not such a mystery i guess because Ukrainian Canadian Congress has been pretty silent about it. Um, this individual is, and in the media now, and or the politicians only refer to him as this individual, um, was a pretty significant donor to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. He represented them as a delegate at the World Forum of Ukrainians, I think it's called, in Kiev, maybe 20 years ago or so. Um, and so they may have had a role in making this happen. But I'd imagine if the government issued an apology to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, they would say, no, it's us who's owed an apology for, you know, the way you've besmirched the, our heroes. Um, yeah, this but... is yeah, so, it just the stupidity here is on a colossal level, but ignorance is, is really maybe more than stupidity. Hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, when I'm talking to uh, some people who, who are going to be writing about this and I see their understanding of history. I you know, I've run into this before, of course. I've 
in fact, years and years and years ago, I was asked about that division and uh, by somebody who knew nothing, but then managed to write something. You know, mm-hmm. there are, there are, I think the problem is that this history has been hidden. All this history has been hidden and it's been hidden deliberately. Well, you mentioned the Deschain Commission, but every time something, some kind of scandal comes up involving the legacy of the uh, Ukrainian Waffen SS division, um, such as with the monuments in Canada and in the United States, um, we're reminded by Ukrainian nationalists that in the 1980s, this uh, Deschain Commission or the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals in Canada supposedly found that these veterans were, you know, totally proved innocent of any wrongdoing in World War II. So case closed, right? Well, I, I, yeah, again, I, again, this is a focus on on the division. And like I have said, the division was, were not the main perpetrators by a long shot uh in in the holocaust uh, so i think that already shows how ignorant the situation was uh however uh you know real breakthroughs came later uh the many of the jewish testimonies were available many polish testimonies what they experienced at the end of, of uh, but as of 1989 the archives began to open and when the archives began to open we had all these ca- captured all own documents uh all kinds of really interesting documents that they had been that the soviets had been able to lay hold of as they were arresting uh uh, uh, people after the war and during the uh, anti-Soviet insurgency, which was led by UPA after the war, that existed, and that and there were people who early on began to work on the topic. So uh, Dieter Paul, a German scholar, began to uh, use these uh, newly opened uh, Soviet archives, which were uh, of our own, and but particularly also of the of the German, uh, various German uh, units and uh, administrative groups in in, uh, in Ukraine. So uh, he began, and then Marko Tsarenik and Berkov went to the Stetsko autobiography and, and pretty much showed how genuine it was. But I, I've i always said the real turning point was 2000 when Jan Gross wrote his book, Neighbors, about uh, about a Polish village, a small town of Yedwabne, where the local population uh, immolated the uh, Jewish population of the town in a large building in a barn uh, and, 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 and killed them all. And that turned attention to beyond the Germans, to the local perpetrators. So that was a major moment. You have to realize, too, I think that uh, there was a spell cast over Holocaust studies by uh, Raoul Hilberg, Hilberg when he found, you know, and he made use of all these German documents. And then he wrote truly a magisterial work, which showed the Holocaust as it looked to the Germans and how they organized and what they did. And for long long that seemed to be everything and uh like for instance in uh in his book the uh, destruction of the european jews um hilberg mentions once Oun, the organization of ukrainian nationalists he never he can't even in the index say what the word the letters o-u-n stands for and he identifies it only as a pro-German organization. So from the German documents, he doesn't get a lot. And he didn't study it. He wasn't interested in, he was interested in the Germans. But when, when uh, and he knew no East European languages, Hilbert. And he didn't take into account witness, eyewitness, survivor, testimony, etc. So you have to understand that kind of 
was, a, as I say, a spell cast over Holocaust studies. Everything was in German. And all you had to know was German. Well, Gross had written two books on uh, Polish society during World War II. So, and he knows Polish really well. And uh, because he was born in Poland, because he's Polish. So he knew all the local sources, he knew all that stuff. And all of a sudden you realize that if he had only German, he could never have written that book. It, you know, it was time for an East Europeanist to deal with East Europe, because what had been happening is Holocaust historians would parachute into Poland without a knowledge of Polish or anything like that. So, you know, one of the most famous books in Holocaust studies is Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. But it doesn't really use any Polish uh, testimonies, uh, doesn't use many Jewish testimonies. It's all the Germans, it's all the Germans. So when Gross makes this gesture, uh, people begin to realize. And then there was, of course, all the studies of pogroms done by Andrzej Zbikowski and others on the, on the pogroms in order to put Yedvabne into a context. And, um, and I think when all that began to be known, all of a sudden, then a number of people uh, Timothy Snyder, uh, Per Anders uh, Rubling, uh, um, uh, Grzegorz uh, Rosalinski Liebe, um, Kai Struve in Germany, me, a whole bunch of people began to look at what was going on in Ukraine. And I had been working, I had been working earlier on uh, on the Holocaust. And um, but when you know all these things came together, and you know other other very important scholars were writing kind of revealing things, uh, yes. Then later we could understand it. But what happened to those of us? Most of us are, uh, well, all of us actually are on the on the diaspora blacklist. You know, people think I'm a Russian agent. Some of them, even though Russia has banned me. In back in November 2022 from ever visiting Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sacrality in the community of their wartime experience um, really has to be shaken up because and that's how these things happen, is if a whole community thinks, a whole community thinks the Waffen-S division Galician was just a really good thing, and I have to say, there were really good people in it because I knew quite, I knew veterans very closely, uh, good people, good people who, who were close to me. But if you think there's nothing wrong, I remember the first time I ever, ever spoke about SS Galicia, and it must have been, oh, 77, 78, 79, that area, maybe even earlier. And I talked about uh, the, the, the division as a collaborationist unit. And uh, a, a, a friend's father and, and an acquaintance of mine said, how can you say they're collaborations? They were patriots. You know, but really, how can you deny that fighting in the German side in World War II is not, is not quintessential collaborationism? That's, that's why they were singled out by the Soviets. Not because of the crimes they committed, but because they, you know, because they were uh, fighting on the German side. So of course they were collaborators. And, and uh, so now I think you know that there's 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 more knowledge out there, but there are people who are doing, you know, whatever they can to silence those those of our voices. And um, so I'm, you know, I I wrote that book. Um, not much interest in the Ukrainian academic community, except from the uh, Ukrainian uh, chair and uh, University of Ottawa. Uh, but otherwise kind of, you know, ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist, you know. Like my grandmother used to say, knowing the Buddhist medilo, that is, don't stir the shit and it won't stink, you know. But in fact, the matter is, if you have shit there, every once in a while, somebody's going to go there and step in it, like Mr. Unka and the parliamentarians and President Zelensky and Justin Trudeau just did. 
So the real thing to do is remove it. Just have an honest history. And again, the, the, uh, the picture of a whole community resisting their, their own history. Uh, and, and that if you say anything about it, it's like le letting out the family secret that Aunt Matilda was, you know, had an affair with somebody else and that's whose child really Aunt Matilda has. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff, except it tries to go on on a whole nationwide basis. But you also have to understand that these are the parents and particularly the grandparents of much of the post-World War II uh, diaspora. It's very hard for them to think about these things. There's an excellent German book by Harald Welzer and a number of other sociologists called uh, uh, Opa war kein Nazi. Uh, grand Grandpa was not a Nazi. And it's all about how these uh, children and grandchildren try to make sense of their um, their parents and grandparents' experiences. And so a, a classic case I remember from there is uh, one uh, uh, when the interviewers interviewed this 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 old man, he more or less intimated that he had he had had to kill a child. And uh, and by the time the grandchildren understood it, he had saved the child. So you know this kind of thing goes on in many societies. Mm -hmm. I'm in the American South right now, and um, <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> I don't know. Before the invasion, I'd think that um, that people like you and Per Rudling have you know these. Uh, Ukrainian nationalist memory war warriors in the diaspora, you know, almost on the run or on the defensive in a major way. But now, I mean, I think they feel totally empowered now. Um, I think they were always empowered, Ron Moss. Mm -hmm. Listen, uh, the donors, the donors wanted, don't want to donate if there's, you know, if the host institution is entertaining critical uh, studies of Ukrainian history. So they always had the money. Um, they can determine what's studied, what's not. So the whole the more has, you know, um, lots of money behind it, thanks to Jim Timurte, a very rich Ukrainian. He founded the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, part of whose mandate seems to be not to really uh, explain the history but to be defensive about our own path. So I don't think there's any real, real difference. I think that um, with the war on. Do you feel like the truth about this history can prevail in a time of just total information warrior war and an actual war um, being fought a lot of people feel like over this history or over the... I think that among historians and among scholars, there can be, you know, real, real discussion on these matters. Although I have to say that, uh, you know, I don't see any Ukrainian historians from the mainstream kind of, uh, I don't see them recognizing the results of our work. So I think they just want to keep it silent. And as I say, you know, don't disturb the, don't disturb it. It won't smell kind of moment. So, uh, but, but, but the, the appearance of a 98 year old hero of Ukraine uh, in the parliament, um, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of uh, a failure to educate the community about the past. And, I really don't care uh, so much about the community. And it's, well, I guess I do care. I do care. I would rather that people uh, had an honest appreciation of, of the history, but I don't, I don't see that this is going to be very easy to accomplish. I thought I was been arguing about this case, about this issue for a long time, trying to warn, uh, warn the community that really you can't do this, you know, you, 
you have to clean your house. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, we're going to be embarrassed. We'll be embarrassed more than embarrassed. We'll be morally embarrassed. We'll be, um, you know, we'll, we'll look like, like, like fools and liars and, and um, not only fools and liars, but as, as immoral people. Well, moving back in time, maybe we can cover just some of the, I know we spent a lot of more time than we intended on the, um, of often SS issue, but um, with the OUN, um, uh, basic, I guess, question to start with, do you consider it a fascist movement? And um, I mean, I, the way I see it, it evolved, it's so founded 1929 in Vienna, and it seems like in the 30s, it evolves from a primarily anti-Polish terrorist organization to, uh, I think, a pro, not fully pro-Nazi fascist movement. And I was wondering if you agree or disagree with this. And so could you talk a bit about this, the evolution um, that they underwent in the 1930s? Well, I don't usually bandy around the term fascist um, for a number of reasons. It's just a term of political abuse. It doesn't have any real meaning. Scholars don't have a universally accepted definition. So... Uh, scholars like Alexander Motil and um, and uh, um, Zaitsev in Ukraine, they have a definition of fascism that says that fascism can only exist in a state. So if you have that definition, Aoun is excluded because it didn't control the state. So if you can fool around with definition, Russia is now fascist. Right, a lot of people are claiming Russia is fascist, so it's a word that's easily bandied about. So I don't like to use it, but they were definitely part of that um, right-wing wave and fascistic wave in Europe. So that they um, they they felt solidarity with uh, first uh, the fascist movement in Italy, and uh, and they supported the Francoists during the uh, Spanish Civil War. They felt um, closely allied to the Romanian anti-Semitic governments, to to the national. Uh, did I mention the National Socialists in Germany? That's mm-hmm. when the National Socialists in Germany were their most was I think uh, a real baleful influence on the organization, because um, you know there was talk that maybe the Nazis were going to support the Ukrainians. People, uh, some Ukrainians thought that Hitler would be pro-Ukrainian, uh, but the Germans had long been funding the anti-Polish uh, underground uh, in Western Ukraine. So, the Ukrainian military organization and the OUN they supported the Germans did, and in turn, the OUN and uh, and the military organization would spy for Germany. In, in Germany, would give them funding, training, this kind of thing like that, and uh, and they had a lot of hope in uh, in uh, 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 German National Socialism once it came to power in 1930. One of the leading ideologues of OUN uh, argued for a Jewish-Ukrainian alliance, in which he said that we can work together because really Ukrainians don't have all the skills that the Jews have, particularly in trade and so forth. If you want to build a viable state, we have to work together. 1933, 34, it all disappears. We become more and more anti-Semitic, more and more pro-German, more and more under the influence of the idea that, that, that there is no morality, that violence is liberating and all this kind of crap. So, uh, you want to call that fascist? You can. I just think it's an evil thing. Um, and I think better to describe what they believed and what they did than to call them a particular name. I want to ask you in particular about this um, faction of uh, Benderites or followers of uh, Stepan Bandera that break with Bandera after World War II and end up getting funded by the CIA um, and uh, 
this group being the so-called the foreign representation of the so-called Ukrainian Supreme Liberation Council. Um, and uh, well, I guess maybe we should start maybe first with UPA, the Ukrainian Surgeon Army. But could you talk about this? Um, it seems like the narrative is that they during World War II, they undergo this transformation. And how real is this? Um, this evolution that they supposedly undergo during World War II that makes um, the Banderites in Ukraine or what's left of them and those in exile acceptable for um, the CIA and you know other Western intelligence agencies. Good. You won't find a complete answer in my book. Um, but I recently wrote... Uh, a response to a round table on my book where I explain the situation a little bit more. So let me explain what was happening. So, you know, in 43, by about the spring, uh, the Ukrainians realized, the nationalists, the Ukrainian nationalists realized that the war is not, that Germany is not going to win the war. And they hold a conference in the summer of 43 in Galicia. And they hold a conference to what should they do? They don't know how the war is going to end. This, by the way, is well documented in an article by Ivan Patryak, who is favorable to Oun. He's a you know, pro Oun scholar. I think he's a member himself of. Oh, I mean, I can't I, prove I, it, but I'm... I, I, don't, I don't know. It could be a card-carrying communist for all I know. Uh, uh, but, so, they try to figure out what's going to happen, How what's going to happen now that Germany's going to lose. And they ponder three scenarios. The first one is that the British and Americans will come up through the Balkans and liberate Ukraine. The second scenario is that the Soviets will come in, but they'll be so weakened after all their struggles with Germany that Oun, the UPA can have an insurrection and it will all be over. You know, they will easily defeat the Soviets and uh, then the nationalists will have a nationalist Ukraine. The third scenario they contemplated was what if the Soviets come in and are strong enough to put us down? Then we have to move abroad. So those were the three scenarios. And they prepared for each of them. So Lebed, Nikola Lebed, was put in charge of foreign affairs. And his group was to deal with the Americans and British coming up to Balkans. And they had to make arrangements for that and have a de democratic program. So they issued such a democratic program. And um, uh, they issued that program promising rights to minorities and uh and all kinds of democratic uh things that while earlier in all our own writings they were anti-democratic okay so so that's what Lebed was set up for he was set up to make Oun upa acceptable to the west hence that program but they also were preparing for the soviet invasion so in the soviet invasion and that was Primarily Roman Shukhevich and uh, and a local and, and Dmitro Klitschkivsky. These are the people mostly involved. Uh, they were to prepare the ground for the uprising. And that meant eliminating anybody who might be in solidarity with the Soviets on their return. So they killed Jews, they killed Poles, they killed communists. POWs, they killed Russians, 
They killed all kinds of national minorities. At the same time as that program was issued, uh, we have a, 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 a testimony by one of the arrested ones and talked about how he went into Polish villages, burned them to the ground, you know, left no trace of them, buried the inhabitants and everything they had. Uh, so that's what they were doing too. And in the end, of course, the third scenario that the Soviets would come back and the insurrection would not be strong enough to defeat them. And in that case, Lebed went, in, went, went to the West. Then July of 44, just as the Soviets were about to take the last bits of Ukrainian territory in Galicia, the uh, UN uh, forms the Supreme Ukrainian and Ukrainian Supreme Liberation Council, Be'er, and they go abroad. And, uh, uh, and Lebed represents, and Lebed and Rebet and a few others of his represent the Uha Be'er, the democratic program of UN, which was designed to work with the Americans and the British. And in fact, this does work. And the Americans sign right up. And just as they took so many uh, other German defectors or pro-German defectors that they could use for various purposes, they decided these people they would support. And I have to say that uh, many of the publications that Uhaber did in the, emig in the em emigration in, in Germany in particular, they published, but mostly distributed in the United States. They were intellectually the most respectable things in the entire Ukrainian community. All the great scholars wrote for them. You know, even I have an article there, a, a youthful article. So so I, that's what it, what it is. It, it's not a division of principle in own. It was a division of labor. In your book, you raise the, um, well, you're quoting someone who says that no such organization as the, I can't pronounce the Ukrainian acronym, but the Ukrainian Supreme Liberation Council saying no such organization as this exists. It only exists on paper um, in OUN's printed propaganda. Do you think, what do you think? I mean, do you think it was a real, because ostensibly this is the underground government of the OUN UPA in Ukraine. And of course the exile. They found that we're leaving Ukraine. They find yeah. that in Ukraine, it's certainly real in the immigration. What about okay? Also, can you address this idea, or how extensive would you say that the UPA's so-called resistance to the Nazis actually was? There was an anti-German resistance. Um, but the anti-German resistance was very calibrated, very limited. So, um. For example, you know, I've been reading um, Miroslav Shkandri's book on the SS Galicia and uh, in the Ma Maelstrom. Well, just want to take a sentence out of it that Soviet partisans uh, were cutting lines of communication, blowing up bridges, and destroying German garrisons. Those are the Soviet partisans. They're also derailing trains that are going to the front to supply the Germans, those are the Soviet partisans. Soviet partisans are also protecting Jewish family groups. UPA is working, it starts in Volynia, north of Galicia. And that area was not in the district Galician, which, you know, the, the, but was within the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. And the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, Ukrainians were treated very bad. Uh, just a bit above the Jews, really. Well, not a bit, more, you know, they, they stayed alive. But roundups, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, kids would be coming out of a dance and then they would be all rounded up and sent to Germany. Uh, for forced labor, Ostarbaita. Uh, there were huge contributions, um, merciless punishments, starvation of cities, and stuff like that. 
And as the Soviet partisans were coming through the forests, which extend from pretty far east and you know even east of Chaniu all the way into Belarus, as the Soviet partisans were going through the forest, coming towards Volhynia, they realized that, that a lot of those Ukrainians were going to join the Soviet anti-German resistance. And especially because in Volhynia, the communists had been very strong before World War II. About half of Volhynians voted for uh, the Communist Party in the late 20s, or Communist Fronts in the Polish elections. So while in Galicia, where the Ukrainians were treated well, relatively well, and where their main uh, sufferings had been under the Soviets, uh, at the same time, the massive numbers of Galicians were volunteering for the SS Galician division, right? In Volhynia, that kind of thing would have been impossible because they had to prevent that population from deserting to the Soviet partisans. And because they were, you know, they were, you know, in Volhynia, many villages were destroyed by, by the, uh, by the uh, anti-partisan uh, attacks. So, so, Oun and Upa had to have a anti-German uh, front because there, otherwise they would have lost the support of the population. However, did they, did they destroy railway lines? Did they burn bridges to prevent? No, they didn't do anything like that. What they did was, they would break up roundups of Ukrainians for forced labor. They would attack small German units. They might free uh, Ukrainian captives, but nothing that would actually hurt the German, German war against the Soviets. So it was a very kind of low key, as I say, calibrated. Let the Germans and the Soviets pummel each other at the front and we can gain from that. But they had to be anti-German to retain the loyalty of the population. It's, and you know, it's it's just a, I'll just throw this fact out too. I wouldn't like to call other people's names. So up until up until they decided they had to have an anti-German uh, insurrection, the Germans were called either the Allies, so Yuznike, or Nimtsi, Germans. But as soon as they decided on that uh, other name, they began calling the Germans Nimake uh, instead of Nimtsi. It's like they called po Poles instead of the normal word Polyaka, they called them Lechie. Instead of calling Russians Rossiana, they called them Moskali. You know, um, and so there was this change of name to show their contempt for the Germans. But in reality, at the same time, very many uh, of the uh, nationalists were still working in the German police. And they found out, I mean, they were found themselves in an incredibly uh, uh, difficult situation because uh, the some of the nationalists were trying to get the police to desert into the UPA. And the Germans, of course, were trying to retain the loyalty of the police. And, and if the police might, might have been flirting with UPA, then the Germans killed them. And if they were too obedient to the Germans, UPA killed the police. So it, was, um, it wasn't some kind of like the French resistance of legend. Uh, against the Germans. It was a calibrated political maneuver. I, I've estimated, but, it's, but, but it was real. It was real. I, I read a very interesting uh, diary of a UPA soldier, one of the few that uh, probably exists. And uh, one of the episodes he has there is how he fights a, a German unit and shows the power of the Ukrainian partisan as he uh, attacks them with his assault rifle submachine gun. 
Well, but then they um, renegotiate um, in the spring of 1944, or they start negotiating. So, yeah. I mean, does does that resistance end at that point, or they make uh, uh, an alliance, but it only lasts months, really. The Soviets take over all of Ukraine by the summer of '44, and uh, and U Upa agreed to to attack uh, uh, Jew Jewish family bands and gangs of Jews, as they were called. In '44, yeah, on behalf of the Germans. Yes, because sometimes the Germans couldn't reach them. They start and end the war on decent enough terms. Yes, yes, they do. Um, you know, at the, but but of course, different reasons for it. At the beginning of the war, they think Ukraine, they, the Germans are going to liberate Ukraine or help them help them liberate Ukraine. They are their allies in the liberation of Ukraine. Uh, but by the end, they just realize the Germans have lost. The Soviets are coming, and you know they want weapons. They want. They want things from the Germans, and they get them as they leave. Well, I um I assume you want to get going soon. Um, I guess maybe I could ask you. You mentioned um. This guy who you call a maverick within the Ukrainian diaspora in North America, Victor Polishuk. Polishuk, yeah. Yeah, who um say a follower of the debates in Ukraine after the fall of communism. He was upset by prominent political and cultural figures calling for the rehabilitation of Oonupa and blamed the Ukrainian diaspora for reintroducing nationalism to Ukraine. How much blame do you think the Ukrainian diaspora rather deserves for reintroducing? Uh, I've, I've written a I've written quite a, I think, new, well, innovative article on that on that subject. It'll be, it'll be coming out. In, it's actually on my Academia Edu White website in English as a text. It'll be published in Germany in German. But here's, I looked at it as this way. There's a, there was a growing, there was a, a cult of un in Galicia that survived from the from very early on. So things I look at. Uh, the fact that the UPA that UPA had an anti-Soviet insurrection. And you know the uh, many many people were on UPA's side against the Soviet Soviets. So they got some, you know, qualified support there. Although in reality, sometimes this UPA in that time was also very brutal. You know, it killed killed some Ukrainians and uh, a lot of violence against anybody who joined to collect the farm and so on. But still, uh, you know, the the anti-Soviet edge of UPA was appreciated by the Ukrainians, especially because the counterinsurgency by the Soviets was really, really powerful and uh, full of atrocities and mass deportations. And then I think very important was that uh, after Stalin died, a whole bunch of the nationalists and others who had been sent to special settlements were allowed to return to Ukraine. Um, and um, they continued to meet among themselves and to uh, not not necessarily have an underground group, but they maintained connections uh, with each other. And um, uh, sometimes they were linked by the underground Ukrainian Catholic Church, which uh, was underground because they they were also released from from uh, from special settlements and from the Gulag. So part of that old Ukrainian population of World War II comes back, the nationalists, people the Soviets had arrested. So that keeps part of it alive. Then in the 1960s and 70s were the dissidents, uh, Ukrainian dissidents who were, you know, looking for um, kind of national um, 
and, and national goals like more Ukrainian culture uh, and who are also looking at human rights issues, freedom of religion, freedom of press, and so on, the dissidents. And the dissidents were sent into the gulag. And there in the gulag, they also met people from UPA and from OUN. And I, I detail it, but mostly not people who had done, and they were impressed by people who had either been only part of the post, post-Soviet, um, the, the post-World War II Soviet interaction, insurrections, or had spent the entire war years already under arrest by the Soviets. So they met the this they met the these UPA people and OUN people and were very impressed by them. Uh, claiming that they were that there was no anti-Semitism among them, no hatred of other nationalities, and uh that um and also their their just their sheer strength, you know, their strength in the of of uh living in that system of the of the political sect, the, the, the political prisoner. So uh, they came back and they were released in the late 80s. And they were among the first to say that oh, Unupan needs to be rehabilitated. So there was, you know, there was a local Galician um, sentiment that was fairly pro, pro Upa. Now, UPA was a violent organization. And let's just take um, one one family that I know. I'm not going to say whose family, but it's close to me. Well, one guy was one guy was exiled for being in UPA. Uh, two two people were thrown down the well by UPA. One person was a courier for UPA and then murdered by UPA. This kind of story is in many families that, you know, they, uh, some people died at the hands of UPA, like, like UPA would kill people for being teachers of Polish or something like that. This is terrible. Um, anyways, um, uh, many people have that. So under the Soviet period, you could talk about, you know, the crimes of UPA and what, you know, what happened to that part of your family, but you couldn't talk about uh, those who had been in UPA. There's a lot of silence on these issues. And, um, and now, after, you know, as in the 80s and 90s, uh, the, when, when these dissidents came back and when you had freedom of speech, Everything came out of the woodwork, you know, and uh, and uh, people wanted to uh, to rehabilitate the organization to give them veteran benefits and and so on. But they necess- not necessarily understood all the history because there was a great silence about these things. Not only did the Soviets not write much about it, you know, about the Holocaust, because they were really not very interested in it, to put it mildly. Plus, they're very anti-Semitic for a long time. Um, the Soviets, uh, so they didn't they they didn't want to write about it or give give people a, a kind of tools to process all that had happened. Uh, the disappearance of the Jews. I mean, lots of Ukrainians benefited from that doesn't mean that they would go and say oh thank god the jews are gone we're here but no but people move were be able to move the the jews of the city and the poles of the city Lviv and other cities were removed ukrainians could move into the cities small towns were almost entirely like three quarters jewish in this area they could now move from the village to the small town and 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 so on so they weren't like missing all this and nobody was talking about it. So there was, um, you know, and in fact, if you look at the, if you, and I write about this in the book, when you look at the rehabilitation of UPA, which did occur thanks to the working group under Stanislav Kulczycki, you realize that they didn't 
even consider war crimes. They didn't even consider the Holocaust. They didn't even consider anti-Semitism because they were still working in the Soviet paradigm about whether these people had betrayed the Rodina, the motherland. And, uh, and, and they come to the conclusion, no, these people didn't betray the motherland. I mean, they were invaded and then they, you know, fought against them. So I would say people were unequipped in Ukraine to, um, to understand what had happened during the Second World War. The diaspora then came back and glorified Ukraine to a great, they glorified the nationalists to a great extent. And they, they transferred uh, institutions from the overseas diaspora or from the European diaspora into Ukraine. So like Prolog, which was the, uh, actually used to be a, a excellent publishing house, but uh, it's journal Suchasnys, which I read religiously because it's the only place you could, you know, read intelligent things in Ukrainian. Um, because the Soviets were just horrible at that time, and the rest of the diaspora was pretty stupid. I thought, oh, I take that back. Uh, uh, but I did, it wasn't on the level. While 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 well, was really a good journal, so they moved back to Ukraine. Publishing house Small Skip, which was a very very good nationalist publishing house associated with Melnikites, that was moved back to Ukraine. Uh, Oun Ban, the Bandrite Oun, moved back to Ukraine. So all these things were moved back to Ukraine, plus all the literature that the diaspora had prepared over all these years was now also uh, being brought to Ukraine. I mean, I had brought literature back even in the days of the Soviets. Uh, you know, and, and, and some of it published by our group, which is a left-wing group, and some of it, some of it published by Prolog, by the CIA-sponsored group. So I don't think it was just the diaspora, but yeah, the diaspora played a part, and the diaspora was considered sort of kind of authentic Ukrainian, which is like nothing could be less less true than that. Mm -hmm. As we see now, as Ukrainians really realize that, hey, we're not the same at all. You've said you're encouraged by a newer generation of historians coming out of Ukraine. Oh, yeah. I mean, in spite of all the work of people like Vladimir Vyotrovich um, uh, and, you know, other nationalists who... Yeah, but Vyotrovich is not really a scholar. I mean, he, he, or if he's a scholar, he's not. He's not a good one. You know, he's he's too too, too ideological, uh, and and he doesn't kind of understand. I mean, I feel he's he's just not adequate as a historian. But uh, among the young people, and even not so young people, uh, there has been a real awakening. In fact, what's interesting to me is that some of the most articulate and critical Holocaust historians actually started by working for Vyotrovich. Hmm. But as they got to see what was what was there, their views changed. Interesting. And and there's others, there's a whole bunch of just, you know, I wrote just after the war broke out, I wrote a little piece I forget where I published it even on a, on the Holocaust historians in Ukraine. Now a lot of them are now out, but not all of them. Like you, you, my book is I think pretty good on uh, on, uh, under, on understanding uh, you know the what what kind of local criminality there was during the Holocaust. But Yuri Radchenko, he's just put out a well, it's probably not out yet. In, and it's in Russian, but it's a really powerful study of local police and their role in the Holocaust. And he goes along the Belarusian, Ukrainian, Russian borders, he takes a whole, um, whole kind of stuff, a whole kind of stripe of, of the territory and analyzes it. It's a very powerful book. Better than my book. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that a lot of that work, like you look at Mar Marta Havrishko's work, the things she has been writing about uh, are very powerful. And the, the advantage that these young historians have in Ukraine is that they have access to all the sources. And, you know, I didn't have a good experience trying to research in Ukraine. Uh, 
So I basically worked from, uh, you know, photocopies and not photocopies, uh, microfilms and scans in uh, institutions that had copied uh, from the Ukrainian uh, archives. Like uh, uh, I was very lucky to have um, a, a, a three month fellowship at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And, uh, and I went and visited back several times where you can get something like 20 or 30 volumes of war crimes trials, which is one of the kind of basic sources for my study, uh, by just sticking a USB stick into uh, into a machine, and you know, half an hour later, you've got like tons and tons of material to work with. So I worked with that. And my experiences in Ukraine trying to work on this topic were not good. So I didn't because you were denied access to archives, or. Well, um, I was denied uh, access to materials I wanted, and and um, and I was um, I had uh, somebody who volunteered to be a research assistant for me in Lviv, and they were denied. So I figured, you know, I figured, screw this. Uh, I can work with what I've got. And I really have a. I had a lot of material. Plus, you know, so I went, so, so much of that stuff is now easily found in photocopies, not photocopies, microfilms in uh, Yad Vashem and in, uh, and in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, you know, all, lots of own documentation, lots of Soviet documentation. Then there's all the Jewish memoirs of which I just scratched the surface. I, uh, use Polish memoirs, Ukrainian memoirs, German documents, you know, and they all they all say the same thing. And even Ukrainian memoirs sometimes even of the own people betray what they did. And, and you know, if you read the book you can see that I I have tons of sources. So I didn't want to um work necessarily in Ukrainian archives because of my experiences. But people like Mark Kotsarenek worked there without a problem. Jagosh worked there without a problem. I think Pear did without a problem. Uh, maybe, you know, I've been in this uh, history business a long time. I think my first publications on Ukrainian history go back to 1970. So maybe I was a known quantity. Plus, I was the first one to raise raise these questions in Ukrainian circles. So that I think also made it more difficult for me to do research there. It's hard to get money for uh, for research. I'm not really good at getting grants. I'm not really good at that kind of thing. I know uh, one particular. Banderite called you a, a hired gun for the Holocaust industry based on the grant you did get with the yeah, Holocaust Museum. As I pointed out to uh, Lozinski, you know, that I was working for the Jews. Yeah, of course I got I got uh, three months uh, at uh, Holocaust Museum, and I think I got a total of was it ten or twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand, but I got way more from. The Canadian uh, Social uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. So really, I, I was working for the Canadians. <laughs> they can only explain things by conspiracy, because if they actually look at you know use Occam's razor and figure out what is the most likely thing that happened, they would be very disappointed. And when I look at the ignorance that, for instance, just led to the Hunka. Um, um, debacle in parliament in Canada here, I realized, you know, it's very hard to break through and get people to get an understanding of what happened. You know, it's not like it's not like Ukrainians are any worse than any other people. You know, the French are were very slow to come to terms, very slow to come to terms with with their wartime past. The Germans didn't start until the 60s. And 
then much later in the 70s, they became more important. And as most Holocaust scholars know, uh, a lot of the Germans literally got away with murder. You know, they just got away with murder. While the Ukrainians, the Soviets, arrested them right away. And they went either for 10 years, some of them were executed. You know, it's it takes a while for a country to to come to terms with because look at American slavery. You know, you're better you're better off coming clean than you know to keep denying stuff and then end up with egg on your face. That's my view. But I could be wrong. Maybe it's better for us to all live in a fantasy world. Yeah, maybe. Uh, well, with that, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, for those listening, should definitely get a copy of Dr. Himka's book, Ukrainian Nationalists and the Holocaust. Go to my academia.edu and website, and you'll find all kinds of stuff there. Well, so thank you so much. Thank you, Moss, for the opportunity to give my views. Thank you.